Welcome to the Standout Job Seeker podcast presented by JobScan. I'm your host, Sydney Myers. In this podcast, we enter the world of the empowered job search, brought to life through one on one conversations with career experts, recruiters, and successful job seekers. We'll explore the journeys of modern job seekers and the strategies that lead to a successful and empowered job search. In this episode, we're talking to Rob Henderson, one of my colleagues here at JobScan. His career has been successful, but not always easy. In this conversation, we talk about the challenges of getting laid off multiple times and figuring out how to support his family. We also talked about how to approach a prolonged job search, finding out that your quote unquote dream job isn't always a dream trying to make a career change, and how to overcome ageism. Rob had so many nuggets of wisdom sprinkled throughout this conversation, so I encourage you to listen to the entire 30-minute session and pay attention to how his perspective on learning and viewing each experience as valuable helped him to overcome his job search challenges. Our conversation starts at the beginning, starting with his career after high school and eventually ending up in publishing. Okay, so starting coming out of of high school, did you have a career path in mind? Like, was there anything in particular that you wanted to do? You know, your a career that you always wanted to have. You know, what kind of what kind of career path did you have in mind for yourself? Um, I would say I had no clue. <laughs> I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I liked to, I liked reading a lot. Um, I was a huge reader. So when I went to college, I became an English major, but I really didn't know what I was going to what's going to do with that. Um, and now you have to remember, this is I'm um, older. So this is, you know, before the Internet. Um, so back before the Internet, it was kind of harder to, you know, kind of explore things and what you might want to do. So my father worked in advertising. I didn't want to go into that, although maybe I should have, but I didn't. Um, so in college, I was an English major. Um, I kind of, uh, wasn't crazy about college and I dropped out because I wanted to work in the real world. I wanted to, you know, I was like, I don't want to do college. I want to get right down to it and start working. And so I did a variety of things. I, uh, I worked in a radio station as a newscaster. I went, I got like a, a certificate, I guess, at a place called the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Um, and I did that for a while. Um, I did a few things, um, drove a taxi and basically after a while I realized that I kind of wanted to go back to college because the real world and working in the real world was much harder than I thought <laughs> mm-hmm. and making money was a lot harder. And I realized that college was actually pretty good. So that's why I went back to school. I was kind of an older a student, which I think is great. I was much more serious and able to focus and, um, so I, you know, eventually graduated with a degree in, in English and a minor in psychology. And I kind of went out into the world still not really knowing what I wanted to do, <laughs> basically, how, like a lot of people. Yeah. So then how did you choose that um, that degree major? Like not knowing what you wanted to do, how did you make that choice? Well, it was just because I liked to read and there was nothing else that really, it was kind of by default. Oh, okay. Um, so that was it. I was just, you know, I was kind of a bookworm as a kid and that's all I really cared about. So couldn't really figure out how I was going to make money, but mm-hmm. that was a challenge. Yeah. Okay. So then you had this degree now, but you still weren't really sure what you wanted to do with the degree. So then, um, how did you like, how'd you get your first job or like, did you have a, a job that you wanted to get or was it still just like, I'm not really sure what's going to happen here? Yeah, I was temping for a while in New York, and it actually paid pretty well. And I did that for maybe up to a year, just temping. Um, And I was applying to some jobs. Um, I got a job in publishing. Publishing seemed like a natural job to get because I liked reading books. My mother was working in publishing, um, or she had worked in publishing. And through a friend of hers really got me my first job at Macmillan Publishing. And I was an editorial assistant. I think it paid $16,000 a year. Um, so that's how I got started in publishing. Mm-hmm. And um, 
you know, I, I liked it. I mean, I, I, I liked the people I was working with. Everybody, I think, you know, if you're going to work in publishing, the one thing that you must have is a love of books and a love of reading. I mean, nobody goes into publishing to make money. <laughs> so the people that I was working with, you know, I was very on, you know, in tune with them and made a lot of friends and I enjoyed the atmosphere. And, um, you know, I did that for a few years. Hmm. Do you find that a lot of people, they get their job in publishing through people they know, or was that a unique experience? No, I don't think it's a unique experience. Um, I think it just worked out for me. I don't know how many people get their jobs through people they know, but it's, you know, networking and your parents count, I guess. I'm sure a lot of people get their jobs, their parents help them. Um, but I know that a lot of people I worked with got their jobs through, you know, the old fashioned way, applying for a job. They saw an opening, mm -hmm. applied and got the job. Yeah. 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 I'd agree with that. I know my, my, actually my very first job. Yeah. I got through my parents. It was kind of the same thing. It was someone that my dad knew and I'm not even sure they were hiring, but he was able to get me an interview and that's how I got that job. Um, okay. So then publishing, what was it like working in publishing? You kind of described it as a glamour job. I feel like it's one of those jobs that everyone wants, like you see them in the movies and they've got like the scripts or the books and they're, you know, sitting on their couch with the red pen in their ear and reading the book. Like, is it, is it like that? What, like, what is, what is the work like? Yeah. I mean, it is kind of a glamour job because, um, and this is in New York city where a lot of pub publishing jobs are. And so, yeah, they're, you know, celebrities and well-known people that you can get to work with. And um, that's a lot of fun. And you can go to a lot of events and parties. And it is it is cool. Um, my issue after a while was, you know, again, I liked reading. Editing was fun. I, but working in editorial and publishing, a lot of it is um, going out to lunch with agents. It's basically putting book deals together with agents and schmoozing. That's the big thing. <laughs> and that was not something I felt comfortable doing at all. And um, I kind of, and also the fact that, you know, I wasn't making any money was a problem. I was at that point, um, I was married and I had a kid, a small child, baby, and my wife worked in theater. So <laughs> between the two of us, we were not making a lot of money and living in New York. Uh, so I began to get very frustrated with that. And, you know, I, I wanted to make more money and publishing just didn't seem like the way to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so what happened was I, I began to, um, I was writing back cover copy and flap copy for some of the books that we were doing and I was good at it and I enjoyed doing it. And I began to, you know, say, Hey, I, I kind of like writing more that is more suited to me. So, and at that point I was working at Simon and Schuster and I applied for a job through the New York Times for a copywriting job at a publishing company. And I got it. And so I started working there for about six years, being a copywriter for a publishing company. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I look back and I sort of, I wonder if I should have pursued publishing. You know, I really had a great opportunity. I was right there. I could have, a lot of people would have killed to have the opportunities I did. And I kind of didn't do it. So mm. I wonder, the path not taken, mm. but what can you do? We all have that feeling, I yeah. guess. Well, I think it's an interesting spot to be in. Like you're in it, you have a job that a lot of people want, but that really clashes with your personality. And it turns out that you don't really like it as much as other people would want right. it. So um, it's like, yeah, what do I, what do I do with this opportunity? Does it make sense to just move on to something else? Was, did you like, did you think about that at the time? Like, was that kind of an internal debate that you had? Or was it like when you're in the moment, you just kind of hate what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, I never hated what I was doing. I, the money was a big factor. And you begin to realize when you're in publishing that a lot of the people who work in publishing, at least in editorial, they tend to be married to somebody who makes a lot of money, <laughs> you know, or maybe they're independently wealthy. That happens a lot too. So again, my situation working in publishing and, and having my wife was working in theater um, and we had a family living in New York, it just what didn't seem very sustainable to me. And it, it, I didn't feel motivated because I'm like, I can really work hard and I can get promoted, but I'm still not going to make a lot of money unless you become a top executive or something like that, which I didn't see myself becoming. Yeah. I didn't have the confidence to think that I could do that. 
at the time. Yeah. And I think a lot of people face that where they have like that job that maybe it's the job that everyone wants, or it's just the job that they always wanted, but then they get in it and like, maybe it doesn't pay as well as they needed to, like it doesn't pay the bills. And they're sort of at this crossroads where it's like, I have the job I always wanted, but I also have bills to pay. And Mm -hmm. sometimes you have to go down a, you know, like the practical path and get the job that pays the bills, even though it's not what you originally wanted. It sounds like though that you had um, an option that maybe wasn't all bad. I mean, you could move into copywriting, maybe paid better, so you could pay the bills, and it's something that you still enjoyed. How did you like? How did you come across that as as an option? Um, well, like I said, I was doing some writing, um, flap copy, jacket copy, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. and I just enjoyed it more, and I felt like I was good at it, and um, I just made the decision. And I can't really stress how much having a child in New York City, you know, motivated me to make more money because, um, you know, it's just incredibly expensive. And we were, my wife and I were both working, so we had to pay for childcare, which was brutally expensive in New York. And it's even more expensive now. So yeah, that, that really forces your hand a lot. You know, if I had, if I, if my wife and I, we didn't have any children, who knows, maybe I would have stayed in it. I don't really know. But as a lot of people, I'm sure can appreciate, once you have a family, it changes your priorities quite a bit. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what- now, unfortunately, I, 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 I went into copywriting, but for a publishing company. And so I kind of backed myself into a corner a little bit because most publishing companies don't use copywriters. This was for a, uh, they, they did textbooks. Uh, this company I was working for. So they sent out a lot of uh, brochures and things. Like I said, this was before the internet, a lot of direct mailing. (laughs) And um, so there was a lot of work. That's not usually the case in a publishing company. So this was uh, a textbook company. So um, it paid better than editorial work in publishing, but still wasn't great. And I was very comfortable though. I was there for about six years and then the company Mer got bought by somebody else. And this happens in publish. That was another thing. Publishing is just constant upheaval. Mm -hmm. Um, Just companies merging all the time and people being let go. And it's just uh, can be kind of chaotic. And that's what happened. That's how I lost my job. Um, We were merged with a much bigger company and everybody at my company who had been there, I think for longer than like five years got let go, including people had been there like 30 years. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of a bloodbath. How, what was that like? I mean, what was that experience like? Um, well, yeah, it's always a shock, you know, when you lose your job. And uh, they did give me a, a fairly, I can't remember what the severance package was, but I, it was, it was, you know, maybe three months or something like that. It was not bad. And I was getting unemployment. And um, I was also doing freelance work because when you work in publishing, you get to know a lot of people. And, there's always freelance work to do. So between the freelancing and the unemployment and the severance, I, um, you know, it wasn't like a just complete fall off the cliff type of situation. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you, when you got it, when you got laid off, were you expecting it at all or was it a complete shock? I seem to remember it being a complete shock, although maybe I shouldn't have once we were being bought by somebody else. Mm. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe it's like, well, something's going to happen, but I didn't really, you know, I was very complacent. You get complacent if you're at a place for a while. And, you know, I actually think that it was, and I think at the time I felt this way that maybe I needed this. I had gotten too comfortable. I was complacent. As I said, I had my own office and on like the 40th floor of this building overlooking the East river, I could see like all the way to Kennedy airport. So I, it was a wonderful, you know, I was so happy this beautiful office. So, you know, it was good that I, you know, kind of got the boot because I, I needed to move on at that point. Mm-hmm. So sometimes being let go can be, a, you know, a blessing in disguise, I think, definitely. Did you see it that way at the time? <laughs> no, you never see it that way at the time. No, definitely. But I can say that, you know, I've had that happen a few, well, a few, few times in my life. And it, 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 when you look back, it does tend to be a blessing in disguise, I think, mm-hmm. a lot of the times. So, um you're laid off, you have kids, but you had the severance package. So that's nice. What's, so then like, what's the next step? Yeah. At that point, I'm like, you know what? I want to make money. I just, I'm sick of this, you know, being poor mm-hmm. uh, and going into debt, living in New York. Um, so I said, 
real estate. That sounds good. So I decided that I was going to become a real estate agent and I went to this school and I got my real estate license in New York. Um, and I was sponsored by this real estate company in Brooklyn. At that point, we were living in Brooklyn. Um, and it was kind of a shady deal, this place. And they taught us things like, you know, read the uh, obituaries and call people because a lot of times when people die, they're going to sell and that kind of thing. Like I said, it was kind of uh, shady. And ultimately, I mean, for somebody who didn't like to do schmoozing, <laughs> you know, this wasn't a good fit, basically. So I kind of made a mistake. But um, what I started doing at that point, the internet was kind of uh, taking off, becoming more mainstream. And I started to, um, I, I got this book about doing affiliate marketing online. And I started to do that and building websites and adding affiliate links. And that began to work hmm. pretty quickly. And I was very fortunate. And the first product I I chose to do this was a like a home run. It was like a, a product that made me a lot of money. So right off the bat, I started making quite a bit of money doing this. And I decided to, you know, I didn't want to do the real estate anymore. Yeah. Although again, kind of regret that <laughs> maybe because this was, you know, the early 2000s in Brooklyn. And I think if I had stuck with it, I could have made a lot of money. <laughs> but um, I didn't do it. So, How did you decide to get to try real estate? It's so different from what you did before. I wanted something that was flexible, that was not a nine to five job, because again, having kids, and it is, you know, it's funny how when you have children, it, it affects all your decisions. And I wanted something that was going to be flexible so that I didn't have to, you know, drop off my daughter every single morning at some daycare place and then, you know, pick her up late in the afternoon because my wife was working full time too. So I thought real estate could give me some flexibility, which it would have. Um, and I could have made you know, money doing that. So I, that's what I was looking for, flexibility and um, and more money, which actually worked out with the um, affiliate marketing that I was doing because I had flexibility and I was making money. So it did work out. Yeah. Was this, um, I want to make sure I get the timeline right. So you were doing freelance work, um, like a lot more freelance work. Like that's when you did the, the National Geographic stuff. Was that during this time or was that before yeah, I mean, throughout all of this, I was always getting freelance work. Okay. Um, just because, like I said, I knew a lot of people in publishing and they need work done. For, and I had, you know, so, I mean, that was also part of my income, my income as well. And I, I continued to do that for a while, doing all kinds of editing, that kind of stuff. Okay. And so that was, or was that helpful after you were laid off to have that network that you could go to for freelance work? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely helped to get, to have freelance work and some of it paid very well and some of it didn't pay quite as well. But, um, I mentioned that I wrote this sort of, well, not children's for, for like tweens, I guess, uh, book on West Asia, I think it was for National Geographic and it paid fantastically. It was really, um, like I said, it paid like $7,000. I worked on it for like a month. Unfortunately, I didn't get any more of those, but, um, so sometimes back then, again, before really people were using, before everything was digital, um, doing that kind of work paid a lot more than it does now. So, yeah, it sounds like the network was really, having the network was helpful in the connections. Also, just like general creativity. I mean, um, you know, like jumping into real estate or affiliate marketing, I can imagine one requires creativity, ingenuity, and then guts too. Like those are two, first of all, two really different things and two things that it's like go big or go home kind of thing. You can't like halfway do it. Did you think about that at the time? Like were you, um, did you feel any like fear or apprehension or was it just like this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to give it a shot? Yeah, well, I think, you know, my personality was, I mean, it, it's kind of a pattern in my life, you know, when you go back, when I look back at college and everything where I tend to quit things a lot. I used to, I'm not like that anymore, but when I was younger, I would, I would quit things very easily. Um, and I don't think that was a good thing. It wasn't a positive thing, but, um, so I've been very used to kind of giving up on something and jumping into something else that was just sort of, uh, came naturally to me, <laughs> but again, not for good reasons. I'm not recommending it necessarily. 
Yeah. But still, I mean, I think like, yeah, the creativity to do it, to try it out. um, Like, I think that's definitely helpful whenever, whenever a person is laid off, um, you have to kind of be creative until you can find that next full-time job. Like you might have to do contract work or freelance work or try something on the side or start your own business for a little bit or make something that you can sell um, just to get you to the next, to the next job that you get. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. And this is something I, I tell my kids, I have two kids, um, they're a little older now, but I constantly say like, just do something, just do something. Like, don't just sit around, you know, feeling bad for yourself. Cause that's something I did a lot when I was younger, you know, I was kind of like, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to kind of figure it out, I guess, but I'm depressed. <laughs> and you know, I was like that, and that's not, it's like, just do anything just because everything is worthwhile. Like there's nothing that's really, I think most people feel like that when they get older, you know, nothing is really a waste of time, mm-hmm. you know, at the time it might seem like a waste of time, but you're always learning something. So just do something, yeah. whatever it is, and, it can, and it'll lead to something else. So can you elaborate on that and describe how, those your experiences during that time of trying these new things and developing these new skills became valuable in later job searches. Yeah, well, I think um, the affiliate marketing, which I did really for, uh, got to be for like ten to twelve years. I mean, that was a big um, chunk of my life there. Um, that was very important for me to do that because the job I have now and the job that I got before this current job at JobScan, that really helped me get those jobs. I, I wouldn't have gotten these jobs if I didn't know about, you know, affiliate marketing, create, building websites, SEO, mm-hmm. which is very important. And um, as we've seen, you know, not everybody understands what SEO is or how important it is, but I certainly did. So being an entrepreneur and working for yourself Mm -hmm. can be great in many ways. Um, You know, your time is your own. Um, You can set your own schedule. You know, I was able to be a a stay at home dad. I'm very grateful. In fact, for the fact that I could stay at home and be with my kids and make money. That was, it worked out um, well, but the downside is uncertainty, uh, lack of a steady paycheck. um, And when things start to, you know, not go so well, with your, your, your own business, um, it can be a real struggle and uh, very difficult mentally, very, very difficult, especially since I began to feel like I was failing. And that really was kind of painful because, you know, before that I felt like I'm so smart, I'm able to do this, you know, and then when it didn't work out, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm a failure. So roll it's a real emotional roller coaster. Oh, okay. And I I had to make the decision. All right, I'm going to get like a real job again like, you know, nine to five real job, which was very, very hard for me to make that decision. And I probably waited way too long because I thought I was never going to have to do that again. Oh, yeah. But I did. And now that I have a, a, a quote unquote real job, I, I, li- I enjoy it a lot. There are a lot of benefits to it, mm. including also just being more social with people <laughs> and having, you know, colleagues. And that's very important. You know, working on your own can be very lonely as well. Mm. So there are pros and cons, definitely. However, just being able to do stuff like that set me up for getting a a job, job. Mm. And I did get a job um, in 2019, something like that, Uh, 2020, rather. Uh, It was, this was um, during the pandemic Um, for a company that sold courses teaching entrepreneurship and they sold courses Mm. on email marketing, digital marketing, YouTube, all kinds of stuff. And so I would create courses and uh, do that kind of thing. And it, 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 it suited me. It was great. And I, it, it, the pay wasn't great. It wasn't fantastic, but <clears throat> it was pretty good. And I worked there for one year. And the company, when I, when, when I started working there, they were hiring people left and right. It was growing. It was like, we're going to be this huge company. Everything was great. And a year later, they let go like 90% of the company. Ugh. And that was even more of a shock than when I got let go back in publishing, it was literally like, I didn't see it coming at all. Hmm. And, you know, one day I had this meeting and it was like, we're letting you go. And it was just, uh, you know, horrible, horrible. I remember I went downstairs and my wife was here for some reason. I just, I just lost my job, you know, really awful yeah. thing. So I know all about losing jobs. I can sympathize with, um, you know, people who 
lose their jobs like that. It's uh, again, it wasn't any fault of my own or anything, but it doesn't make a difference. And this time there was really no severance or anything like that. So Mm -hmm. it was, um, that was pretty brutal. Yeah. How did, I mean, what did you do after that? Well, um, I was out of work for about, of course, I was, you know, able to get unemployment, which is very important. Um, yeah, I was out of work for four months, which I'm realizing now isn't that bad. <laughs> At the time, I thought, this is terrible. Four months, I can't get a job. But um, from what I know now, you know, that's like kind of uh, within the range of normalcy. And um, I just kind of... Um, went about looking for a job in a very um, process-driven way. It was like, I can't fall into a depression. And the the best way to not to fall into a depression when you're unemployed for me was to just, at the end of every day, feel like I did what I could today to get a job. I, you know, I spent this many hours looking for work. I applied to this many jobs. And I think that that's, you have to be kind of, um, make it like that's your job. Your job is looking for a job. Hmm. And I think that's the most successful way to do it. And just kind of look at it like, look, everybody in the world gets up and does stuff. Everyone's just doing stuff. And that's what I'm doing. I'm getting up and I'm doing stuff. You know, I'm looking for a job. That's my stuff. Yeah. And that helps to kind of keep you emotionally and mentally steady. Yeah. Yeah. How was that job search different from previous ones? I mean, I guess because this time you didn't have the severance. So was the like stress or pressure different? Oh yeah. A lot of stress, a lot of pressure. Um, it was very different because now everything is of course online. And that's another thing I wanted to get a remote job. So this was, I live in Vermont, you know, I live two miles up in a dirt road. So I, I couldn't, and I did look for jobs that I would around here locally but, you know, the, there's not that many. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I need to get a remote job like I had previously. And, yeah, it's just a whole different world. I was just um, – and I did I, – I, I had quite a few interviews. and um, But it was um, – yeah, it was difficult. Not fun. Um, so during this time since you were later in your career, did you face the issue of ageism during that job search? I guess either – maybe the first time you were or the job you had before this or just during this job search, like, was that a challenge that you felt like you were facing? Um, yeah, definitely. I think that when you're older, um, it's hard to say if people are saying, Oh, he's old, we don't want him. Um, but cause I think that I was able to convey to people that I knew about things like SEO and building websites and that's all technology. So I had been kind of keeping up with technology. So, and again, I think that's very important if anybody is taking time off to raise their kids, um, which can be a you know, period of many years. I think it's important to try to keep your hands, in, try to do something that that eventually you will, that can um, benefit you when you try to look for work. Mm. Um, I know a lot of people are like, well, I'm just never going to get a job again. I'm just, I'm fine. I can just stay home. But you'd be surprised. People decide, especially if the kids get grown, a lot of people are like, I want to go back to work. And if you've been doing something like I, what I was doing, which was involved in technology, that can really be helpful. Mm-hmm. So if you've, if you've just done nothing but kind of raise your kids, uh, I think it puts you behind an eight ball a little bit if you're looking for work. Mm. Definitely. Did you adjust your your strategy in like during this job search compared to when you were younger? Like, did you have to adjust um, your resume or interview questions to um, share like that experience or to make sure they didn't get the wrong idea about your age? Like, were there adjustments you had to make make in the way you presented yourself? I think one thing. Well, I, I think it's. You know, I went through a lot of interviews and um, I began to realize that the more interviews I had, the better I got at the interviews. Yeah. Like it was um, so sometimes it would be like, well, I don't even really want this job, but they offered an interview. I'm not, but I said, I'm going to do this because it's great practice. And after a while, you really begin to get a good sense of what people are looking for. Mm-hmm. And for example, I had coached soccer for like 10 years as my kids are growing up. And I even coached one time at the local high school. And, um, 
you know, I, I didn't think it was that important. It was, it was on my resume, but I was, I didn't really bring it up because I'm like, well, who really cares about that? You know, but I began to realize during interviews that people would kind of perk up and be interested in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I talked about it more and more and more and made it kind of a bigger thing because I'm like, yeah, I had to deal with all these kids and the parents and the school and, you know, and the thing is, I didn't quite realize it at the time, but it's like, there's a lot of soft skills involved in that. You know, mm -hmm. there's communication, there's problem solving. It almost covers every soft skill there is. And um, I think a lot of job seekers really underestimate the importance of soft skills. Um you know, hiring managers think it's very important. A lot of them think it's just as important as, as hard skills. And soft skills, again, are things like communication, problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, that kind of stuff, um, as opposed to like, you know, SEO or website development. That's Those are hard skills. So I did, um, I ended up talking more about my volunteer work, which um, I think is very important. You know, my son is creating, a, <clears throat> making a resume right now. And I said to him, hey, <clears throat> he's in college. I said, have a hobbies section and say, you know, you like to play guitar. And he's like, why, I, why would I do that? That's stupid. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, they don't care. I play guitar. I'm like, no, but it shows the soft skill of like creativity. Mm -hmm. And learning. Yeah. Yeah. So those types of things are very important. And mm -hmm. um, I think anybody who's been out of the workforce for a while, especially is very important. Mm -hmm. and, and I learned that. But um, yeah, I definitely got better at interviewing and began to realize how to sell myself in a way that, um, you know, people would respond to. So <clears throat> yeah, just take the opportunity to interview as much as you can. And don't worry about if you don't get it, don't worry about if you fail, or you're, you're going to learn something from every interview. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then what would be based on your experiences of being laid off and, you know, trying to make a career change, then realizing it work out and just your entire career um, as a job seeker, what would you say were like the biggest takeaways for you of like, these are the things, if you were going to tell someone um, how to get a job, what are the core things you've learned that helped you get the jobs that you got? Yeah, I, I just, you know, I am a big, I, I, it, it sounds kind of corny, but I do love to learn. That's like something that I, I'm constantly, I have new things I'm always learning about. I'm always interested in something. And if you see me one year and then the next year, I'll be, you know, I'll be into something else. So that's kind of my personality, just constantly liking to learn. And um, I think you've said that you're similar mm -hmm. as well. And I think that that is a very, uh, that's always going to save you. I think if you if you if you're the kind of person who constantly likes to learn and is interested in the world, um, that's kind of key. You know, I think Andy Warhol said something like the world fascinates me. And I think you need to have that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. And if you do, then you're not going to to me, that's what people talk about ageism. I mean, and I know a lot of people who are older, they just stop learning. You know, it's just like they're just living in the past and they listen to music. That's, you know, what they listened to when they were. 30 years old and, and that's fine. But I think it's always going to benefit you professionally if you're somebody who likes to constantly learn about new things, especially today, because we all have to continually learn about things and learn new skills. And that goes for anybody, I think. Yeah. And I think that's really been the key to why you've been able to have a successful career is that like you were able to try different jobs, you were able to overcome some of these challenges because of that mindset, you all, you were always learning new skills or, or even like, it's not just that you had the experience is that you intentionally learned from that experience, which helped the next time you were looking for a job and, and so on. Yeah. I mean, even coaching soccer, I, I, I didn't like soccer when I was younger. I, I hated soccer. I was <laughs> into, you know, football and baseball. And the only reason I started coaching soccer was because when we, when we moved to Vermont, I called up the town and said, well, my daughter was starting to play soccer where we used to live in New Jersey. And um, do you have, we'd like her to continue that, you know, there's something to do. And they were like, I said, do you have a soccer team? And they were like, well, we do if you want to coach it <laughs> because they did not have any teams. So I was like, I don't know anything about soccer. And they were like, that's okay. You know, <laughs> these are just kids. So that's what, that's what got me started. I mean, there really was no soccer team here in this town. And now they do. So maybe I started soccer. Wow. The town. That's pretty cool. So. 
Um, so anyway, I so I've now I my son became very interested in soccer. So now I know a lot about soccer and I'm very into it. So it's that kind of thing. It's not like I was willing to learn about something that I kind of, when I was a child, hated because mm-hmm. I think, you know, you go back, a lot of people are like, yeah, soccer, it's next. Now, of course, it's a very big thing. Mm-hmm. So you have, to be willing, you have to change your mind, be willing to change your mind about things as well. Mm-hmm. That's another thing. It's not just learning. Well, that goes with learning new things. Mm-hmm. If you're going to learn new things, you have to change your mind about a lot of things constantly. I think that last statement perfectly summarizes the key to a successful career and successful job search, being open to new things and always learning. So thank you for listening. You can read Rob's job search advice on the JobScan blog at jobscan.co, where you can also use free tools to make your job search easier and faster. I'll see you next time on the Standout Job Seeker podcast. Podcast.